Ready to get in the Word. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up. <clears throat> Excuse me, to John chapter 15. As we're going to be looking today at John chapter 15, verse 26 through 16, verse 4. I had us a lot farther, but I didn't get but through verse 4 for service, so I'm not going to go beyond that. This one. And um, I told, as I told them, have Bible, will babble. <laughs> so I apologize for that, but it's all good, rich stuff. We're getting into doctrine today about the Holy Spirit, so we don't want to go through that necessarily quickly. Uh, a lot of solid doctrine on the Holy Spirit, who He is, what He does, how He does it, and uh, certainly not an exhaustive study on the Holy Spirit, but Jesus is going to be covering a lot of attributes of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to work through them this week and next week so that we know who it is we're dealing with in dealing with the Holy Spirit. So uh, John chapter 15, let's pray, and we'll get in the Word. Father, I thank you, Lord, for giving us the Holy Spirit. Truly, Lord, it is a precious gift. You are a precious gift. And Lord, the fact that you would give yourself to us in the form of the Spirit, that we might be taught and that we might be comforted and that we might, Lord, be helped and that we might learn and be led and all these things that you do by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, help us to understand who you are better by your Spirit today. Help us, Lord, to recognize the work of your Spirit in our life today and help us, God, to understand the purpose that you were sent and the work that you're fulfilling in our lives and in being those witnesses for Jesus. So I thank you, Lord. I pray now you pour out your spirit. Lord, just minister to us by your spirit as you teach about yourself this morning. And we thank you, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at the work of the Holy Spirit, it's interesting. Um, we're going to be seeing that he's a helper and he's a comforter. There's going to be several different attributes that we see about the Lord. But one of the things that's interesting that really uh, we're not going to talk about as much once we get into the body of the teaching, as I'll mention now, is, is that is really he's kind of the guy behind the scenes. If you want to think about the Holy Spirit, he's the guy behind the curtain making sure that the whole production in your Christian life is going the right way. He's your guide. He's your helper. He's your leader. He's your comforter. He's everything in that sense. But he does not draw attention to himself. And we'll talk about that today and see, again, uh, some of the, um, I think, abuses, and we're not going to get into much of that, but just to mention some of the abuses of the way the Holy Spirit is presented is not really who He is. And I, I know that He wants us to know who He is, how He operates, how He functions, and so that we can understand His work in our life better. And so uh, we're going to see, as I said, not everything about the Holy Spirit today, but foundationally, many of His attributes and the first thing I'll point out is something we've noted before, even in recent studies here, and that is he is a he. The Holy Spirit is not a it. He is not a force like Star Wars or something you can manipulate or tap into in that way. He's not a liquid, although the Bible does say the Holy Spirit is poured out on us. It just means that God basically pours out his spirit, his power on us. But he himself is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is a he. And that's huge foundationally in understanding who the Holy Spirit is and who we're, who we're dealing with as he works in our life. Again, he is a, a part of the Trinity of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But his role is very different. Now, it's, again, his main focus is to lift up Jesus. That's what he does, lift up the name of Jesus. And that's when oftentimes you see people that are uh, speaking about the move of the Holy Spirit, they oftentimes lift up the Holy Spirit. Now there's nothing wrong in recognizing the Holy Spirit for who he is, but at the same time, the eyes are to be on Jesus and the Holy Spirit's job is to turn our eyes to Jesus. Something we're gonna get into next week, and that is you've often heard of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and oftentimes I run across even believers that are afraid, oh no, maybe I can't go to heaven. I've committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. No, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is something very difficult, and basically there's only one way you can do that is if you reject Jesus Christ your whole life and then die. Why? His job is to bring us to Jesus. And if we don't allow him to bring us to Jesus, it is blasphemy. It is an insult to the Father. He says, I've given the earth my son to die for your sins. And you're going to just look me in the face and say, I don't want it. I don't want your son. I don't want what you've done for me on the cross. If that's the case, you'll be eternally condemned. But it's the only thing that will do that. And again, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But his role is to turn our eyes to the Lord, to give help and comfort, to reveal biblical truth, to give power to the believer to walk with God and to do the work of God. So notice that it's not just to give us power so that we can uh, do the work of God, which we think about, I need God's power to do his work. It's so that we can walk with God. Listen, I need power to be able to walk the Christian life. How many of you guys? I know you do. You need the same power. We can't walk this Christian life without God. 
That's what the helper does. That's what the comforter does. And so, again, we'll see that as we get into this um, more today. And so notice, again, remember our setting here, where we are. In John chapter 15, the Lord's final night with the disciples. He's teaching them. Some would argue that he's actually still in the upper room. I do not believe that because earlier we saw he said, let us get up and be going. I believe he headed on down before chapter 15. You know, Lord, it's the end of chapter 14. Let us be going. No, that, not that kind of thing. But anyway, I believe it was before chapter 15 uh, because he talks about the vine and he already told them they were going to leave. And I think he actually used the vineyards, if you will, to make that illustration and to teach them. So he's still teaching them either on the walk down there or they're there sitting maybe by now actually um, uh, going through this but he starts here in chapter 15 verse 26 and starts teaching them about the Holy Spirit because he's about to leave and he wants them to know they're not going to be alone by the way how many of you feel alone today you're not alone you may feel alone but I don't have any friends and I, my marriage just fell apart or whatever reason you have to think you're alone listen to me you are not alone the Holy Spirit is with you if you know Jesus Christ, you will never be alone. You may feel that way sometimes, but we don't live our life as believers by feelings. We live by the reality and faith and the teaching of the word of God. He said, I am with you and I will be with you always. You're not alone. How many of you need comfort this morning? He's gonna talk about that as well. God will give you the comfort that you need. So you need to recognize that. And the disciples needed to recognize this. He was about to leave them physically. They're about to go through a lot more than probably any of us in this room ever will. And they needed to know they were not alone. They needed to have that comfort. And so we need to have that as well. And so now he begins this teaching about the Holy Spirit. And notice he says in verse 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, note this, he will testify of me. Now, although this is at the end of the verse, I want to point this out first. The first thing the Lord will, says the Holy Spirit will do, he will testify of Jesus. Why is that so important? Because there are so many wrong teachings about the, the work of the Holy Spirit and how he moves in the believer's life. And there's so many things even within the church that are not accurate about the, how the Holy Spirit works. And again, you've seen this before, and I know there are some good Bible teachers on TV. I recognize that. I'm not saying they're all bad. But it seems like for some reason there's a lot of guys on TV that are really bad. And so I'm just going to say it. And a lot of times they really misrepresent the Holy Spirit. And some of them maybe you've seen, of course, over the years I've seen it. I really haven't watched it recently, so I don't know what's on there now. But my guess is because of what I saw in the past that it hasn't changed that much because Satan uses the same tactics that he wants to deceive us and trick us. And I want to say this. I think sometimes maybe some well-meaning Christians uh, don't understand really how the Holy Spirit works. And so there are some abuses there as well. And it may be the group they grew up in or the way they were, they were brought up, but they weren't really taught about the, the things Jesus is teaching us here. But you'll see all kinds of things where they're like, take the Holy Spirit supposedly and throw it on people and entire sections will fall down you can't grab God and throw him at somebody you can't do that and I don't mean to be flippant I'm being very honest but I'm speaking very truthfully I've seen them blow on people and people fall over and all this that is nowhere found in scripture it is very sensational it draws a big crowd and if I start doing it we would grow we would grow as a church if I started doing real, you know, demonstrative, whatever, whatever, because people are, a crowd is drawn to a good show. But you have to understand when it comes to the Holy Spirit, he's not here to do a show. He's here to show Jesus and to point the eyes to the Lord. And so he will testify, he says here, of me. That is, when he comes, he's going to talk about me all the time. So if you want to know, is God really moving by the power of his Holy Spirit? You're going to see that Jesus is the one being lifted up. Jesus is the one being talked about, not the Holy Spirit. Now, again, that doesn't mean we ignore the Holy Spirit. He's God. And somebody asked me, um, was it Wednesday? I don't remember. They said, hey, is it okay to pray to the Holy Spirit? The answer to that is yes, but that's not our focus. Let me explain. Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, they're all one. To say, you know, to say, Holy Spirit, help me at this moment is not sin. To say, Jesus, I need you right now is not sin. But Jesus said this, we're to pray to the Father. In general, he said, pray to the Father. But we also pray to him because he and the Father are one. And we can ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. So you're not wrong by praying to any of them. But our main focus is not to pray to the Holy Spirit all the time. 
Our main focus is to pray to the Father and to pray to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one that is the helper. He's the one, again, as I said, behind the scenes, turning eyes to, to the Lord and being the one that's our support. And so now we get to really the first thing it mentions in the verse, although I, 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 I mentioned first the fact that it'll testify of Jesus because I think that's a huge foundation. But notice that the first of the verse who he says the Holy Spirit is, he is our helper. And why a helper? Because God knows we need one. You know, we did the wedding yesterday and I pointed those guys out as we started. You know, one of the things in there that struck me is that the wife is called to be the helper of the husband. And ladies, how many of you know that your husband needs a helper? I think that's pretty evident. But what's neat for the church is we're the bride of Christ, but it's different. We have a helper as well as the bride of Christ and it's the Holy Spirit. He helps us. Guys, we need help. How many of you this morning need help in some situation? Right now, you need help. Right now. I want you to know something. The Holy Spirit is here right now to help you. This isn't a pep talk. It isn't drama. It isn't to make you feel better. Now, it'll do all those things, make you feel better, and it'll build you up. But it's a reality. He says, I, this is Jesus' word, not mine. I'm going to help you. So if you need help, what do you do? Ask him. Lord, I need help right now. I need help this morning. He will be your helper, and he will give you what you need in the midst of it. And so the first thing that I love about this, he is our helper. Now, it comes from the word, it actually is the word paraclete, which comes from two words, para. We talk about para alongside. So paraclete might be another way to say it, but we pronounce it paraclete. And then the other is, is cletus, cletus comfort. Uh, so you have the helper who's the paraclete. It means helper or one who is a comforter. And that's where we get the, the, uh, the other word that's used for the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the paraclete is the comforter. And while these two words are by no means all-encompassing, they have the basic foundation of what the Holy Spirit does. Again, foundationally, we know he points to the Lord, but when it comes to our life, he's our helper and he's our comforter. So that's why if you need help, you cry out to him today. God will give you help. If you need comfort, how many of you need comfort this morning? Isn't comfort something we need on a regular basis? Man, I mean, I need to be comforted all the time. I need God's comfort. I need God's strength. You know, it's amazing. When I have God's help and God's comfort and God's encouragement, I can do anything. When I don't sense that, I feel like I can't do anything at all. And yet he's always there. But if we need that comfort, God, give me that comfort. I need it. And there's probably many different reasons some of you need comfort this morning. Ask him. You promised Jesus. You said you would give the comforter. Give him to me. I need the comforter. And so I love that. And this is amazing to me. Notice the next thing here in the verse, really the third thing we're looking at, because I kind of you know, reversed the verse around. But he says he was sent by the Father. That is, he's a gift sent by Jesus, literally. He said, I shall send to you from the Father. He's not only sent by the Father, he's sent from the Father. Let me correct that. But it's Jesus that does the sending by the agency of the Father. In other words, get this. What he's saying is, I'm very, very personally involved with your relationship to the Holy Spirit. See, I like that. It's very exciting to me. Why? Because in my mind, I kind of have corporate office, right? And we all get in and we're suddenly all in there and we're just in the kingdom of heaven and the spirit, you come in and whoom, everybody gets the spirit and we're all together. And while that's true and while we're all family and a part of it, this doesn't give a picture of suddenly we're just into this big thing and we're number 5,692.1 or whatever. And here we are and we get our whatever. No, he's saying, look, I'm going to the father and I'm going to say, Father Mark needs a helper and he needs a comforter. And so I'm going to ask that you send Mark, the Holy Spirit. It's not just this blanket Holy Spirit, although he's for all believers. He's saying, I want, I want Mark to have him. So would you send him, Father? Absolutely. I mean, put your name in there. What this is giving a picture of in the language is, is that God went before, Jesus went before the throne of heaven and to the Father mentioned you by name and said, I want you now to send your spirit to them, to that person. If that's not intimate, guys, there's nothing that is. That is intimacy. And, and I love the intimacy the Lord shows with us. As a matter of fact, back when we covered the, the being filled with the Holy Spirit, the way that John the Baptist said it was being baptized in the Spirit. The way that Jesus said it was being baptized in the Spirit. But some people, for some reason today, have a problem with that phraseology. I don't. It's biblical. But whatever you want to call it, being filled with the Spirit, being baptized with the Spirit, whatever you want to say, Jesus said this, I reserve that right to myself. That was mine. We're going to do two baptisms this year. We're going to do one in June. We'll be announcing the date on that soon. I think, well, maybe the 24th. I don't, I, I'll give you a date on that. I'll let you know when our first baptism is. Then we're going to do another one in August. 
and we do a couple every year. And what happens is, is that we usually have, you know, a good group of people that show up. I mean, usually it's somewhere at least around 15 people. Sometimes we've had as many as 20 and above show up to be baptized at both of these events. So I have somebody baptizing with me, you know, and, and they'll come out in the water and we baptize together, you know, and especially some of you guys, I get these guys that are giants and are way bigger than me. And I'm like, you know, I need somebody to help me get them back out of the water, you know. And so we'll be out there doing baptisms and we'll usually take turns. I'll say, okay, I've got this one coming out. You know, Julie coming out. Can you take this one? You take Joe. Joe coming out. And we take turns, you know, so to speak, back and forth baptizing so we can be a part of it, pray over them, and, and share this experience. But sometimes there are people that say, Pastor Mark, I really want Travis to baptize me. Or Pastor Mark, I want you to baptize me. And they, say, they name some event because this, that, whatever. And so we do that. But here's exactly what the picture is Jesus is saying when it comes to being baptized in the Spirit. He says this, when they come out in the water, that one's mine. Jesus, he specifically said, I'm going to do the baptism of the Spirit. That's something I'm going to do. And we saw that earlier in John, where he says, that, that's a right I reserve to myself. What did John say? There's going to be one that's going to baptize you with water. He said, but there's one coming after me. That is, John the Baptist can baptize in water. Any pastor can baptize in water. He said, but there's one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and power. And that was Jesus. He reserves that right to himself, which means he went to the Father, take your name, put it in there. I'm good. This is, I want you to send the Holy Spirit to fill in the blank. And they're mine. They're mine. We're not going to mass baptize. We're going to take 100 people at once and go, no, I'm doing it one by one. Mark, step up here. And Jesus baptized me in the Spirit. And he brought you up. He baptized you in the Spirit. And he wants to do that for every believer. Now, we're all brought into the body of Christ when we give our life to the Lord. The Spirit indwells us. We know that. But receiving that power and that infilling, you say, Lord, I want to be empowered. I want to be infilled. It is a very personal, intimate between you and the Lord and the water of the Spirit. And God's just pouring out on you. And that's what God wants to do and what God does. So you can't lose. And I don't want you to lose the intimacy of what he says right here. This is very, very intimate. It's very, very one-on-one. -on -one, and it's just very, very personal. It's exciting. I mean, you're not just a number. You are created by him. Everything about you, he knows. He's dealing with everything in your life, every detail. He's the one to baptize you. He's the one to commission you. He's the one to make sure you get into the kingdom of God. He's the author and finisher of your faith, the beginning and the end, the one that's going to have a place for you forever at his table. He knows where you're going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to serve, everything about you forever. Is that cool or what? That's the God you serve. And so I feel sorry for anybody else that doesn't serve this God, not just because they're lost, but because they don't know the intimacy that we know. I had somebody come up after first service and say, I heard somebody talking about what's going on in the world. All this stuff is happening and all these, you know, events around the globe or whatever. He said immediately, it was like, he didn't say it was the Holy Spirit, but I know it was the Holy Spirit spoke to him because he said immediately, I knew at that moment, you know what? They don't know because the Bible says the world won't understand what's going on. He said, but you, my disciples, you'll know and you'll have comfort. He said, I knew what was going on. I have comfort. I have peace. Lord, thank you for showing me what's happening. That's the God we serve. We're a part of the family. We're, we're on the end. We hear the behind the scenes stuff. And so this is what the Holy Spirit does. He reveals it to us. Man, I can't wait for next week. I wish we could have gotten there today, but we're going to look a little bit at Isaac and Abraham and the whole bride that's brought and all the stuff to go. There's some really cool stuff. So anyway, let's get stay focused, Mark. Stay focused. Um, notice again here, uh, thirdly, our, our next he says, what else is he? Not only is he sent by the Father, notice he says he's the spirit of truth. Aren't you glad to know that the Holy Spirit will tell us the truth? How many people are looking for truth today? Everybody. And yet, how many people really have it? Oh, everybody thinks they have truth. Everybody thinks, everybody has their philosophy about what truth is. I left this morning, and I'll probably, again, say the, the wrong name of this book. If I'd known I was going to use it, I would have uh, jotted it down somewhere, and I'm sure my daughter will tell me when I get home I said it wrong. But when I left this morning, I noticed one of my girls' college books on the counter, and it said something like this, philosophy, the search for truth or something to do with truth and philosophy. And I remember noticing that, not paying attention because I didn't know I was going to use it in the teaching, but walking out the door going, isn't that interesting? And as I begin to look, we're again reminded that Jesus said, I'll give you the spirit of truth. The world is looking for truth. And they're looking for truth everywhere. In every religion, in everything, in every tree, in every rock. What is the truth? I'm trying to find the truth. And Jesus said, note this. He didn't say, I have the truth. He said what? I am the truth. Is that exciting? He is truth embodied. And he said, now the Holy Spirit's going to take one of mine and give it to you. He's going to give you the truth and tell you the truth because the spirit of truth will reveal the truth to you. So it's exciting to know that we have that and we don't have to search. There's no searching going on other than reading the Bible and praying. You have the truth right in front of you. And our job is simply to believe it and to share it with others. 
And then lastly, as we said, we already covered, he'll testify of me. Notice verse 27, he says, and this is great. Look at this, it's not just the Holy Spirit is a witness to the world. We are. Look at verse 27. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. In other words, the Holy Spirit is bearing witness. He is a witness to the world, but we are witnesses as well. Now think about this. The Holy Spirit is the world's witness. Literally, there's nowhere the Holy Spirit can't go. He's everywhere. The jungles of Africa, the darkest places of North Korea, where, where, where things of God are so oppressed, wherever you want to go, he's there. He even says this. He says in Romans chapter 1 that even if they don't hear the name of Jesus, he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show them God by nature itself. I'll reveal God to them through creation, which means no one will have excuse on judgment day. Some of us will have more knowledge than others, but everyone, it says, will know there's a God and that we're accountable to him. How? The Holy Spirit is witnessing to the entire world. He's the world's witness. He convicts everyone. Again, we'll get into more detail next week about what that means and how he convicts and what he convicts over. But the bottom line is, is that he's not only the, the witness for the Lord, you are. What he's saying is, is yes, God will send the Holy Spirit, but you're going to bear witness as well. You've met me. You know me. Tell people about me. What makes you think you know the truth? I've met the truth. That's why. You may not believe it, but I know the truth because I know him. And he belongs to me and I belong to him. And I want you to know about him. And so you're witnesses to the Lord. It's, it's very encouraging. And what a great privilege. It's not something you have to do. It's something you get to do. And so now we come to chapter 16. And by the way, don't be stumbled by, I know we kind of uh, did a verse, couple of verses before, now getting into 16. The chapters and the verses were added by people later. They were not a part of the original manuscript. That's so we can find our way around the Bible. And it actually flows better, I think, uh, starting in verse 26. But either way, now we come to 16, verse 1. He keeps on going. And notice what he says. These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Now, he's about to share a lot of things they're going to face here that are very, very life-changing for them. Things that are going to be very hard and very difficult. And, and things that are going to come at a great cost. And so knowing they're going to have great difficulties and a great cost in walking with the Lord, he wants to make sure they don't stumble. Guys, note this. The only thing you stumble over is something you don't see in advance. If you're walking through the house and it's dark. Are you going somewhere and you don't see what's there? You stumble, right? Because why? You didn't see it. But Jesus is doing this. He says, I want you to know as my followers, if I tell you in advance you're going to have some hard times following me, you won't stumble when it happens. You're going to go, you know what? This is exactly what the Lord said would happen. I think one of the greatest detriments we can do to any believer, a new believer, say, you know what? Everything's going to be great for you now. You gave your life to the Lord. Everything's going to be great. Never worry about it. God's going to take care of all your problems. <laughs> Really? How many of you walked with the Lord any length of time? Your problems don't go away. You just have a helper and a comforter, right? As a matter of fact, as believers, oftentimes the problems get worse because now your family rejects you, your friends reject you, the world rejects you, and the enemy's attacking you. Now, I'm not trying to talk you out of Christianity, but I think we need to be sober about the Christian walk. It doesn't mean that everything is great all the time. What it means is you need to know what you're doing when you sign up. When you sign up, you're going to have spiritual warfare. You've got all these things that are happening, but here's what you get. Well, then why would I do it? Why would I sign up for something that's going to make my life harder? Here's why. You get heaven forever, and they don't. See, your payday's coming. You may get abused now. Payday's coming. And it's going to be an amazing, awesome, eternal payday. Never goes away. Never stops. Always joy. Always glory. Always happiness. Always everything. Yes, now is hard. I get it. But don't stumble when it gets hard right now. Don't stumble when your family rejects you. Don't stumble when you're called a right-wing religious fanatic, whatever they call it. Don't stumble by that. Realize Jesus warned me this was going to happen. I'm ready for it. And rather than stumbling, you can step right over it and keep walking. So you know what? It's what I signed up for. My payday is coming. I remember hearing about a missionary that was coming back from 30 years on the mission field in Africa. And he was on the same boat, uh, boat as, as, as I believe President Roosevelt if I remember the story correctly, one of our presidents. Anyway, the boat's coming in, and there's this massive crowd waiting on the president. Everybody's cheering the president, you know, da, ba, ba, da, ba, ba, and this whole big fanfare or whatever. And they're on the boat going, this guy just gets elected. He's in there for a few years. He lives in a nice house, and then he's done. We've been in Africa suffering and sweating for the Lord. He was telling his wife this. 
We've been suffering for the Lord for 30 years, and there's not anybody here playing a trumpet for us or waiting on some reward. You know, we come home, look what he gets. He comes home, he gets all this stuff. We come home, nothing. She said, honey, we're not home yet. Isn't that great? See, sometimes we look for our reward too early. Now's not reward time. Now we work the fields. We work the fields. We plow. We plant seed. We don't get smacked on the back. Sometimes we get smacked on the face. But in heaven, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy, the joy of the Lord. And it just, whoa, I mean, it's just beginning. This is just the beginning. So the excitement awaits us. And he says, don't be stumbled by this when this happens. Know that it's coming. Be ready. There's going to be hard times and persecution. I want you to know that you're not following the wrong person and that somehow you hadn't signed up for the wrong thing. And he warns them. It's interesting to me. The first ones he warns them about are, guys, notice this. He says to them in verse 2, they will put you out of synagogues. Notice this is the religious crowd. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he offers God service. Look at this. The first thing Jesus warns them about where they're going to face opposition and people in their face, so to speak, is what I'm going to call, you ready, the religious unsaved. Guys, we are surrounded by the religious unsaved in the South and a lot of believers as well. And we're surrounded by the religious unsaved around the world. And the problem with the religious unsaved is, is they're trying their best to be holy and righteous and maybe wear all the right things and say all the right things and do all the right things, but they don't know God. So when you come along and you do know God, they don't like you. You're an offense to them. They're the ones being religious. They're the ones doing their practice. They go to church this often. They pray this much. They give this much. They do this much. See, here's, get this. There is biblical religion. I know it's widows and orphans. It tells us in James, it's giving to widows and orphans. But there's also a principle of a godly religion that truly is serving God. The problem is Satan has taken a hold of that term and today's religion and really religion throughout history has been man's attempt to reach God. It's man's attempt to reach heaven. Whereas a relationship, which is what we have with Jesus, is Jesus reaching down to the earth and getting us. Two very diametrically opposed things. The Lord has come and gotten us, and now we have this wonderful relationship. Religion is, I'm going to earn my way to God. I'm going to go to church this much and read this much and do this much and be nice this much. And the problem is when you do that and when you're trying to make yourself be a good person when on the inside you're really not, it's easy to get cranky. And especially against those who seem to have joy and they're not doing what you're doing. Wipe well, that stupid smile off your face. I'm, I'm higher up in the church than you are. What are you. Who do you think you are? And I'm telling you something. The biggest opposition I got when I first came to the Lord was not the unbeliever on the street. I found that most people I shared with or ran into were like, they would at least listen. The biggest opposition I've run into as a believer has been the religious unsaved. I'll never forget one time being at this event where they have all these different people there and all these different churches and all these different representatives. Nothing wrong in a robe, don't get me wrong. But the robes are what attacked me. The robes were the one, the robes and the collars were the ones that hated me. Not the street people who were drinking and doing it. They were like, man, tell me, I need hope. But the robes and the collars, well, you just think. There's this arrogance. There's this pride. There's this ugliness. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I had a real quick education as a new believer that everybody that wears a robe and a collar, that doesn't mean they know God. There's nothing wrong in robes and collars. I'm not saying that. I'm making a point. There's a lot of wonderful, safe people who wear robes and maybe wear a collar. I'm not, okay, please understand that. But I'm saying when I ran into the religious unsaved and I saw the opposition, I got to realize, I know what he's talking about. They're going to kick you out of church. You're not going to fit in with them. They're going to kick you out of synagogue. They're not going to understand what this relationship thing is. Why are you so happy? What are you doing? Why are you wearing blue jeans? What's your, you, there's a problem. You have a problem, right? I just know Jesus and I love him. That's all I know. And I've got more to learn, right? And that's who we are as followers of the Lord. That's why you read the Bible. It says the, what the common people heard him gladly. They heard him gladly. And it was the religious, the unsaved religious people that Jesus rebuked the harshest. Again, these guys kicking out of synagogues, they'll think whoever kills you will offer service to God. To understand to be put out of a synagogue in that day was huge. Why was it so huge? Well, today, if you get put out of a church, you know, you're disfellowshipped and you go just to, say you get put out of church or whatever. It happens very rarely in churches today. But when it does happen, all you do is go to another church. I think there's something like 700 churches now. It's probably not the exact number, but something around 700 churches in Knoxville now. So if you go to some church and they put you out, you've got 699 more to choose from. And you can go from boom, 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 boom till you find one. This, okay, this one fits and forget those people. I never liked them anyway. And there you're in your new church. It didn't work that way back then. 
if you were kicked out of the temple and the synagogue, which they had synagogues in, in, in the individual towns on the temple, you couldn't go to church anywhere in the nation. Imagine if a church put you out today and you couldn't go to church anywhere in the nation. That gets you serious about what you've done real quick, wouldn't it? And that's the point. It's supposed to bring church discipline so it'll make you look at your life and go, whoa, what did I do so bad that I can't go to church? I need to look at myself. Now, if the church is weird, the church is weird. Ignore it. But if the church puts you out and you're the one weird, you got to say, I need to deal with this. So the bottom line is, is that's what would happen to him. He said, that's going to happen to you. Know, that's one thing. You'll be kicked out of the synagogues, but you're also going to be kicked out of the temple. That was a central focus for the nation of Israel. Everyone wanted to go to the temple. Get this. You couldn't offer a sacrifice to God except in the temple. And back then under the law, if you couldn't go offer a sacrifice to God under Jewish law, not understanding Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, your sins could not be forgiven. So not only were you put out of church all over the nation, you couldn't have your sins forgiven. Now, it just, that's about as bad as it gets. But on top of it, if you were put out of the synagogue or temple in that day, guess what else happened? You couldn't get a job. You couldn't get a job. You couldn't work anywhere in the nation. If it was the same way today, to give you how strong this is culturally, what the Lord is saying is going to happen to some of them. It would be like saying, you'll be put out of your church. You can never be forgiven of your sins as far as the, the world is concerned, the way they look at it. And of course, they could be forgiven. They knew about the cross. But giving you the cultural mindset, and you can never work in the nation again. Which means if you want to provide for your family, you have to move to a new nation. That's how serious being put out of synagogue was in that day. Here's what he's saying to them. Guys, listen to me. Some of you are going to be put out of synagogue. They knew exactly what that meant. Some of you are going to be put out of the temple. They're like, whoa, we follow you. We may have consequences this big. Absolutely. But you know the truth. Nobody's putting you out in heaven. You've got your place secure in heaven. And you've got your place secure with me. I'll take care of you. I promise to do that. But be ready. Why am I telling you these harsh things? I don't want you to stumble. Because some of you, when they kick you out of synagogue and you can't work for your family and you can't do these things, whatever, you're like, if I, what have I done? Am I following the right guy? What's happening? I'm telling you now so you won't go back. Don't give up when it gets hard is the point. Trust me in this. And I've told you in advance. So this is a big deal. Now, it's interesting. The word here, he says, when you'll, you, you don't be made to stumble. It's the word scandalizo. You probably know what word we get from that. Scandalize. What he's saying is don't be scandalized. Don't think it's a scandal that you've been kicked out of your job and out of church and out of everything else. If you've done it for my sake, he said, you trust that I'm in this. I'll be the one that'll protect you. I'll be the one that will provide for you. It's, it, you're, don't be scandalized about it and think that something has gone wrong because everything is fine. And then notice what he says here again. This is interesting because this is true with every generation, and we see it in ours as well. It takes, it takes different forms throughout history, which I'll cover briefly. But notice what he says. Whoever kills you will think he offers God service. It's not just whoever kills you will be like, I'm glad I killed that Jesus freak. It's whoever kills you will think, you know what? God's pleased with me for killing that guy. God's happy with me. See, in Jesus' day, it was the Jews. Paul went around killing people. So the Jews were killing people. Also, the Romans the Romans were killing Christians. And, and so the Romans here, they, the Christians came in, they were fine for a while, but when the Christians started, this is interesting, when the Christians started teaching the word of God, in Rome it was morally corrupt. It was sexually corrupt. It was, in every way it was corrupt in Rome. Again, um, uh, Aliel was in Rome recently because she's over in Italy finishing up her Bible college degree. And so her last semester is over there in Italy, which is really cool. But they took a trip to Rome and to see where Paul was and do some of that stuff. And she sends us this message, we're in Rome. And I texted her, I said, remember, when in Rome, live like a Christian. Because that's who we are. Whether we're in Rome or whether we're here, wherever we are, we live like a Christian. But what did the Romans do? Because they were teaching, look, abortion is wrong. And yes, they had abortion back then. They said abortion's wrong. Same-sex relationship is wrong. Go down the list. I'm just hitting some of the hot-button issues today, making us feel just enough uncomfortable to know the point I'm making. That's what the Christians were doing in Rome. They were teaching the Bible, and here's what they said. You guys are haters. The Christians in the early church were known as haters of men. That was their nickname. Get that. Does that ring a bell to anybody? When I saw this whole hater thing coming a few years back, I started going, you know what? Satan, we know his wiles. He repeats the same thing throughout different generations. He's doing the same thing now that was very successful in Rome. Six million Christians were killed by the Romans. Now, I don't know if they thought they were doing service to God. They probably thought they were doing service to their gods, but not the God of the Jews. But again, why? Because they were seen as haters because they were standing on the word of God. And I believe you're going to see the same thing happen in this generation. Listen, the Bible says the Roman Empire is going to be revived. It's already happening. We're watching Europe now rise. 
We can get into that later. That's a whole prophecy study. But the bottom line is, the Bible says in the last days, Daniel chapter 2 and Revelation, you're going to see a revived Roman Empire, which means you're going to see some of the same things that came with Rome coming upon us. And that is Christians are going to be known as, yeah, haters. Although we love, we love. Jesus was accused of the same thing demon-possessed, all these things. Christians, it's going to shift over more to the Christians, which is already happening right now as we speak, by the way. But the bottom line is, the Romans did that, thinking they were doing service for their gods. Well, the Middle Ages, what happened? The Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church killed loads of believers. That's part of her church history. It's ugly, but it's true. They killed lo loads of true believers. Why? They thought they were doing God a service because the, they weren't coming under the authority of the Roman church and following the Roman church. So they were putting them to death. They were, they, and they believed they were honoring God and do that, doing that. What do we have today? We've got Islam. Alu Akbar. That means God is great when they, when, they, when they carry out their terrorist attacks. Why do they yell that? They're saying, we're doing God a service. We're killing the Christians. We're killing the infidels. God is happy with us. Jesus said, I want to warn you about this. When it happens, don't freak out. I know it's going to happen. I'm telling you in advance it's going to happen. Don't stumble by it. They really believe they're doing God a service. They're just, they don't know me. Well, he's going to explain why, they, why they're doing this and how the fact they don't. Look what he says. He goes on and says this, verse 3, and I've got to hurry here. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father and they have not known me. Why does the Muslim want to kill the Christian? They don't know God. They think they do. They don't know him. Why, why did the Catholic Church leadership of the Middle Ages, they didn't know God? Why did the Romans kill the Christians? They didn't know God. Why did the Jews in the first century kill the Christians? They didn't know God. Jesus is saying, look, if they knew me, they'd love you. But because they don't know me, they're going to hate you. It's a spiritual battle. And they don't even know what's going on. Jesus said on the cross, what? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it was the religious leader standing at his foot when he said that. It tells us the rabbis were down there mocking him. Yeah, if you're the son of God, come on down. It was the religious unsaved. And they were gathered around him. And so the Lord said, that, I, that, I, boy, I, God's love and grace. You know, I don't know that I would have said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I would have said, just burn them all now. <laughs> and get this thing over with. This is horrible. So the love of the Lord is amazing to me. Because he loves the religious unsaved. He loves the religious unsaved. They just need to have their hearts softened and have their eyes open and come to the truth. So he loves all. But that's why these groups would kill. And that's why they believed they were doing a service to the Lord. Notice he says, but these things I've told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. In other words, you didn't need to have, you didn't need to know that I was going to send the Holy Spirit to protect you. And you didn't need that the whole, to know that the Holy Spirit was going to be there to guide you through all this because I've been with you. I've been your Holy Spirit. I'm the one walking in person, but I'm about to go to the Father. You're going to need the Holy Spirit. Now I'm telling you these things. You need it. And since Jesus isn't here today, guess what we need? We need Jesus. And we need to be be mentally prepared for what's coming. If that's as far as we're going to go today. We'll start next week, as I said, in verse 5 and, and look more at the works of the Holy Spirit and the attributes of the Holy Spirit. But guys, here's what I want to leave us with today. And this is what I want to really encourage us in. And that is this. Look, do you need a helper this morning? If you need a helper, Jesus is here to help you, but you need to ask him and then let him work in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you need a comforter this morning? Maybe you're, you have a lot of unrest for whatever the reason. I need some comfort badly for whatever the reason. The comforter is here in power to minister to you by the power of the Holy Spirit and comforts you. But you've got to ask him and you've got to let him. And lastly, I'm going to say this because I'm going to pray for us that God would be our, our helper and our comforter this morning as we leave. But you know, as I was thinking about it, I can't just pray for the believers. Maybe you don't know the Lord. Maybe you're the religious unsaved. I'm not calling you out. I'm not, I'm not asking, could all the religious unsaved please stand? We're not going to do that. But maybe you realize this morning, I'm here at church, but I don't know the Lord. I'm being religious, but I'm unsaved. If that's you, here's all you have to do. It's very simple. The Bible says Jesus died for you by name. He died on the cross. And when his blood was poured out, it forgave you if you'll receive it. You have to say, Lord, please forgive me. I know I'm a sinner. I believe that you died for me on the cross. I receive you. And the Bible says if you do that, you'll be born again. Why do I say that? Number one, because I want you in the kingdom. Jesus wants you in the kingdom more than I do. I want you there, but he, he died for you. I didn't, but I want you there. He loves you and wants you in there. But you, you don't have the option to have the helper if you don't know him. 
You don't have the comforter if you don't know him. You need to know him to receive his help and to receive his comfort. So I want to pray for us and give you a chance to receive him if you don't know him. And then for those of us who do, to receive his help and his comfort. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit and the fact that you are our helper and you are our comforter and you are so much more to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I thank you that we as believers can have that. I, I just pray, God, that if there's anyone in here right now that needs a helper and they know they need that help, as a believer, they begin to cry out to you and ask for that help because I know you'll meet them in power. If there's anyone in here this morning that needs that comfort from the Holy Spirit, the comforter, God, I know that you'll comfort by your Holy Spirit and by your power. You just need to ask, he'll do it. Begin to ask him. And so, Lord, I pray you'd move by your spirit and do what you do, ministering to your flock and showing your love and your grace and your comfort and your help and all that goes with that. Lord, I pray lastly, if there's anyone in here who doesn't know you, they don't even have access to the Holy Spirit's help. You said, Lord, to your followers, the world wouldn't know the Holy Spirit. They can't know him. If that's you this morning and you know you don't know God and you don't know the Holy Spirit, confess your sin right now. It's not hard. Just say, I, you don't have to confess them all. God will convict you of what to confess. Just say, forgive me of my sins. And ask him to do that right now. And then tell him you believe that he died on the cross for you. Say, Lord, I believe that you died for me and your blood was spilled for me on that cross. Let him know. And Lord, I ask you to forgive me. And now be my Lord and my Savior. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. And the Bible says you'll be born again and you'll have the helper and the comforter and all the other things that the Holy Spirit does. God, we thank you and we praise you for the work of your spirit this morning. To the believer and those, Lord, that have been drawn in that may not be believers yet because you are a witness and there's no better witness than you, Lord. We thank you for your work and we bless you this morning and praise you. And thank you for what you've done in our hearts and through your word this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.